Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Continuing in our theme about why countries might not end up developing nuclear weapons, today's topic is preventive war. The idea behind preventive war is straightforward. In the past, we've talked about how the main motivation for acquiring nuclear weapons is to enhance one's own security against rivals. But put yourself into a rival's shoes. You might not want to concede that security. And indeed, if you calculate that the cost of war today is worth securing and preserving the status quo distribution of power into the future, then taking preventive action is a reasonable thing to do. There are a few instances where states have actually engaged in that sort of preventive war, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the majority of this lecture. To start things off, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of the nuclear era and discuss the Norwegian heavy water facility sabotage. We've seen the different isotopes of hydrogen before, and they're becoming important again now. Your standard hydrogen isotope is protium. This is the thing that occurs in nature by and large. That consists of one proton and no neutrons. The deuterium isotope has one proton and one neutron, and the tritium isotope has one proton and two neutrons. Deuterium and tritium are important for putting in an actual nuclear weapon itself. That's because if you expose deuterium and tritium at very high heat, they will fuse together. And that fusion can create energy and create neutrons, which are useful for creating a larger explosion. I want to focus on just protium and deuterium for now. If you go to your tap or go into the ocean or basically look at any source of natural water, the vast majority of it is going to be two atoms of protium and one atom of oxygen, H2O. That's your standard stuff. But there's another type of water that occurs naturally in trace quantities, heavy water. Heavy water replaces those protium atoms with deuterium atoms. We call it heavy water because in each molecule of heavy water, there are two extra neutrons as compared to your regular water. Those two extra neutrons make it way more, and hence we call it heavy water. And in contrast, we might call regular water light water. Heavy water is useful for the creation of nuclear weapons. If you have enough of it, you can run a reactor with unenriched uranium. This will create plutonium. And if you can extract that plutonium through a reprocessing procedure, and you get enough of it, then you can put that into a nuclear weapon. Norway had the first facility that could produce heavy water at scale, and this created a problem during World War II. After Nazi Germany occupied Norway, there was a concern that the Nazis would extract the heavy water out of this facility and start using it as a part of a nuclear weapons program. As a result, the Allies and local resistance engaged in a number of operations to try to destroy the facility. This ultimately culminated in an Allied bombing run, which was successful. However, there was still an existing stockpile of heavy water. Nazi Germany tried to extract it from the site on the SF Hydro. But as it was floating away, it was sabotaged and ultimately sank. Next up is the Fox Bats over Demona incident. You will recall that this facility in Demona was central to Israel's construction of a nuclear weapon. There's evidence that suggests that Arab allies around Israel, as well as the Soviet Union, were aware of its importance and plotted to try to destroy it. According to this theory, those Arab allies tried to provoke the Six-Day War so they could have an excuse to destroy the Demona facility. The Soviet Union was in on this, and actually had fox bats flying over the Demona facility, getting ready to destroy it. However, at the start of the war, Israel quickly demolishes the Arab allies' air forces, and this runs the plan. As a result, the Demona facility survives, and Israel ultimately acquires nuclear weapons. Next is Operation Scorch Sword. In the late 1970s and into 1980, France agreed to construct an OSIRIS-class reactor in Iraq. 
Putting those two words together, they dubbed this facility Osirak. OSIRIS-class reactors use highly enriched uranium to run, and thus this was a proliferation concern to the countries that surrounded Iraq. In retrospect, there was a strategic blunder in the construction of the reactor. This is what the area where Osirak was constructed looks like today. It was basically in the open desert. That made it an easy target, and two states went after it. First up is Iran in Operation Scorch Sword. This took place as a part of the broader Iran-Iraq War. Iran was concerned that Iraq might eventually acquire nuclear weapons in the middle of fighting, use them against Iran, and end the war in its terms. And regardless of that, the Osraq facility looked like a high-value target. And so they went after it. On September 30, 1980, four Iranian F-4E Phantom Jets, like the one on the right, flew toward the Osraq facility, dropped their payloads, and did significant damage to the reactor. The facility was not fully destroyed, though, and that takes us to our next instance of preventive action. And that is known as Operation Opera. The Osirak facility also concerned Israel, and armed with Iranian intelligence, they set out to finish the job that Iran started. On June 7, 1981, a squadron of F-15s and F-16s, including this exact F-16, set out toward Iraq. This is a more challenging bombing run than what Iran faced. Unlike Iran, Israel does not share a border with Iraq. As a result, the F-15s and F-16s went to the south part of Israel, deliberately avoided Jordan, flew over Saudi Arabia, dropped their payloads on Osirak, and then returned in about the same way they came. Before the run, an Israeli spy had planted a homing beacon inside of the reactor. This allowed the bombers to score multiple direct hits and render the facility completely inoperable. As an interesting side note, it's alleged that the King of Jordan was on his yacht in the Gulf just south of Israel at the time of the bombing run. He sees the planes flying overhead, he recognizes them as Israeli, and he notes the direction that they're flying. And putting all of these puzzle pieces together, he concludes, correctly, that Israel is trying to bomb Osirak. That being said, due to a failure in communication, the message is not fully relayed from him to authorities in Iraq. That prevents Iraq from scrambling its defenses and allows the bombers to succeed. Israel receives a slap on the wrist in the United Nations Security Council as a result of this action. But the United States, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and as an ally of Israel, could exercise its veto power to prevent Israel from receiving any real sort of punishment through the Security Council. As a result, this is a massive success. Israel achieves all of its goals and pays very little in consequences. Indeed, this pretty much quashes any plans Iraq had to develop nuclear weapons. Fast forward to 1991, and after the Persian Gulf War, the facility is in complete shambles. Here we have IAEA inspectors going to the site, and what do they see just lying on the ground? Well, it's yellow, and it looks like cake. Therefore, it's yellow cake. That's the milled and processed uranium. It's just sitting there. That's how destroyed this place was. Of course, Iraq still had interest in acquiring nuclear weapons. They just couldn't get very far. Nevertheless, we still have preventive motivations underlying the narrative that resulted in the 2003 Iraq War. The final preventive action to talk about has a couple of names, Operation Orchard and Operation Outside the Box. In the early 2000s, it's alleged that Syria paid North Korea to send nuclear scientists to the country to start development of some basic parts of a nuclear weapons program. Israel caught on to this, and as a consequence, launched the operation. Executing a bombing run very similar to Operation Opera, they destroyed the facility. And when you combine that together with what's happened in intervening years in the Syrian civil war, the Syrian nuclear program hasn't gone anywhere. I want to end by thinking a little bit more holistically about the strategic interaction with preventive war. 
The idea here is that if a country sees its opponent developing a nuclear weapon and wagers that the costs associated with preventive action are less than the consequences of the impending power shift, then they go ahead and fight a preventive war. The goal here is to destroy facilities. You can't build a nuclear weapon if you don't have the facilities necessary to create all of the products that you need to put into a nuclear weapon. But this leads to a second order strategic thought process. If you can't protect your facilities, then there's little point in trying to develop a nuclear weapon at all. And as we're going to see in the next lecture, this becomes a game in countries trying to figure out how to protect and hide nuclear facilities to make preventive war impossible. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.